God doesn't feed you. Not like I do. Hello all, Peacock here, and welcome to the Outlast 2 dinner! Yay! It's another Peacock Plates. We're on episode 2 now. Exciting! I know! Yay! More yay! So for this meal, the main focus is going to be a kid charred rack of ribs with a pomegranate sauce and an asparagus corn salad. God knows we spent enough time in that cornfield. Why not make a corn salad to remind us of the wonderful time we had running through that cornfield. For dessert, we're making cranberry meringue tarts. Um, they just look really nice. They have such a thick, red, deep, kind of oozy center that I thought would be very appropriate uh, for like the blood rain and just everything else bloody we experienced. There was a lot of red stuff. Red was a pretty big color for this game. And of course, we can't make our dinner without a cocktail. We are going to be doing the Papa Noth cocktail. You'll see where the uh, Papa is in our cocktail when we get there. All right, so let's get to it. This time we're actually starting off with the dessert first because it's going to need some time to cool before we're actually going to be able to eat it. First off, we are going to need some pie dough. Uh, I don't have a specified amount here. I just asked my friend to make some pie dough for me. She has a really great recipe for a gluten-free, dairy-free pie dough that I can actually eat. So usually when I do stuff like this, I just ask her to make it for me because I don't know her recipe and I just never seem to be able to do it as well as her even when I ask for her help doing it. But you could also just use pie dough from the store. I don't care. Make it yourself if you want. Go that extra mile. It's up to you. You are also going to need some little mini tart pans. Uh, I prefer the ones with the removable bottoms. You don't have to use ones like that if you don't have any or you don't want to. You could just use a regular one. Again, always up to you. You could also just use a regular pie pan if you wanted. Instead of making little individual ones, you could just use the same recipe to make one giant uh, cranberry meringue tart. So we are gonna start our tart off by taking a little bit of our pie dough, kind of pressing it out into a disc if it's not already flattened with like the pre-bought store kind. Um, and we're going to press that into our tart pans, our little tart molds. I purposely made the walls on my tart a little on the thick side because I did want these to be able to stand up without the mold, uh, the tin being around them. And then you are going to press that dough into all of your little tins or your pie pan, whichever you're using. And then once you've finished that, you are actually going to just use your fingers. If you want, you can use a blade for this, but just remove the excess from around the rim. We just want a really nice, clean, flush top to the little tarts. And once you have all of your little tart pans lined with that dough, you're gonna take a fork and make sure you dock the bottom or poke a bunch of holes in it. Um, this is just to kind of help prevent it from forming air bubbles and popping up and essentially becoming uneven on the bottom. And then once you've finished docking the bottom of all of your little tart shells, you are then going to put them onto a pan and put them in the freezer for about 15 minutes. Next step, is to then blind bake these. Um, if you don't know what blind baking is, it's essentially just pre-baking your pie shell. But before we can put them in the oven to blind bake them, we do need to line the bottom of them, um, ideally with wax paper. Uh, in this case, I didn't have any on hand, unfortunately, so I went without. But then on top of that layer of wax paper, you're gonna either put some dried beans. I've seen some people do rice, um, though I don't know how well that works. I usually just use beans. Some people will even use ceramic beads that are meant specifically for blind baking pie crusts. Uh, I don't think those are really necessary. If you want, you can buy them, but you can always just use beans and these beans you can also just cook with later too. So I just think it makes a little bit more sense to use what we already have on hand. And once you have the weights in the bottom of there and they're all set to go, you're going to put them into a 375 degree oven and they are gonna bake like that for 15 minutes. Once that 15 minutes is up, you're actually gonna take them out Remove those pie weights, um, which is a lot easier if you did in fact line them with wax paper. I did not, but thankfully I have the blood of the dragon. So I used my hands to remove those piping hot beans. Once you've removed your pie weights, you're then going to put them back into the oven for an additional five minutes to cook. And once our time is up, we are actually gonna take them out and let them cool on a wire rack for five minutes. 
After five minutes, we're gonna pop them out of their tins and then let them fully cool. And on to our filling. For this recipe, you're gonna need in total three and one fourth cups of cranberries. Um, you can use fresh or frozen. I used frozen because of the time of the year, only frozen were available. Uh, and you're actually going to put only two cups of that in the pan to start, and we're gonna save the rest for later to add in after we've cooked things a bit more thoroughly. To our two cups of cranberries, we're gonna add the zest of one orange to that, as well as a cup of sugar and a cup and a half of water. We're then gonna bring that to a boil, and once boiling, we are gonna reduce it back to a simmer, and then we're gonna simmer that, stirring occasionally for about five minutes until the cranberries start to burst. And once the cranberries have started to burst, we're gonna grab ourselves a sieve or a strainer, as well as a very undersized, extremely shallow for what we're trying to do bowl, because it's what we had on hand. We are then going to very awkwardly try and arrange the sieve in there so it doesn't fall over and pour your cranberry mixture into that. You can also take a spoon and you can actually press the cranberries against the sieve or strainer as well, just to get a little bit more of the juice and maybe some of their pulp as well. Once you've ran them through the sieve, you should have about a cup and three quarters of the cranberry mix. If not, you can just add some water to this until you get to a cup and three quarters. We're actually gonna be putting that back into a saucepan to cook some more. But before that, we are gonna add a fourth a cup of sugar, one fourth teaspoon salt, an eighth of a teaspoon of cinnamon, a pinch of clove, and our remaining cranberries to that pot. We're gonna bring that to a boil, reduce to a simmer, and let it cook until the cranberries are soft, but not burst. Should take about three minutes. And while that cooks, we're going to juice one orange and add three tablespoons of cornstarch, as well as a quarter cup of water to that. Again, whisking in an undersized container. We're then going to add that cornstarch slurry to our cranberry mix off the stove. We're then going to pour it out into our little tart shells and we're gonna let that cool in the fridge for about an hour or overnight. Now we're on the final leg of our dessert journey, the meringue. You're then gonna take a minimum of two vessels and three room temperature eggs and we are going to separate the egg yolks and the egg white. When it comes to separating egg yolks and egg whites, um, I prefer the method of you cracking the egg and going back and forth and using the little egg cups to separate the eggs from the egg whites. I also prefer doing this over its own separate container. And then after I've thoroughly separated the egg and made sure there's no egg yolk in with the egg white, which is really, really important, um, I take that container of the just the egg white and dump it into the final container that I'm gonna be doing the actual mixing in. Um, that way, if you accidentally mess up and you drop a yolk into that container you're separating out over, you don't ruin a whole batch of egg whites. It's just a smarter thing. I have ruined so many batches of egg whites by like getting to that final egg and accidentally dropping a little yolk in there and now like you can't really fish it out all that well ends up mixed in there and then they're just useless for making a meringue with it's just easier this way saves you time uh, it's only one extra dish you can deal with that one extra dish dude and in my case my final container was actually the same saucepan we've used for everything else it's really important when you're whisking egg whites that you do it in a metal container. I did also use the spoon to kind of swirl over the top of them just to give them some really nice ridges because hey, what's a meringue without some nice toasty ridges? Difficult to actually whip it properly so that it holds the structure we're gonna need. I actually forgot my electric stand mixer at home when I was doing this recipe. Thankfully, my friend did have a hand mixer um, that I could use so I didn't have to whip the egg whites by hand, which is a nightmare and I've done before and it's just so much more difficult. We're then gonna whip those egg whites until they're very foamy and kind of starting to form soft peaks. Once we're at the soft, loose peak stage, we're going to slowly add a fourth a cup of sugar while whisking. Once all the sugar's been added, we're going to add a pinch of cream of tartar to that, just to kind of help stabilize things and keep our fluff fluff. 
We're then going to take our tarts out of the fridge after they've set for at least an hour and we're going to dollop a little bit of our meringue onto each one. Um, and I'm just using the back of a spoon, but you could also use an offset spatula just to smooth things out a bit and bring it almost to the edges. Um, I left my edges open a little bit so you could see a bit of the cranberry sauce underneath them. We're also going to be putting these back into the oven to toast the meringue and I was kind of hoping that some of it might boil up over the edges a little bit and kind of make things a bit more less clean. So if there's one thing Outlast isn't, it's clean. Once you've got all the tarts covered in meringue and they are swirled and dotted to your satisfaction, you're going to put them into an oven with the broiler on low and you are just going to have to really, really keep your eye on these guys. Um, I did actually end up burning two of mine uh, and I took them off the tray so that you guys wouldn't see them. But yeah, keep a really close eye on these. Don't let yourself get distracted. And they're pretty much good to go. I would let them cool. Um, otherwise, if you cut into them right now, that filling is still going to be pretty warm from being under the broiler. And it's just kind of going to leak and ooze everywhere. So better to let them cool. And that concludes dessert time. And next up is the main star of the dish, and that is going to be the kid rack of ribs. Um, so obviously not a real kid. I mean kid as in goat. We're doing a rack of goat. You could also do a rack of lamb as well. Um, either way, I just thought it would be very appropriate for the game that we played. Also, I love lamb and I love goat. They're both delicious. You're gonna wanna take the rack out about an hour before you're actually gonna be cooking this. We're going to put our rack into a pan and we're gonna cover that with about three tablespoons of oil and then a lot of salt and pepper. And make sure you rub that into there really well, um, getting all the little nooks and crannies, just make sure it's very evenly seasoned. After seasoning it, we're going to put it under a broiler set to about 500 or 450 or so. Uh, and we're going to broil that for five minutes, flip it, and then broil it for another five minutes. And while that is going on, we are going to mince six cloves of garlic. And then with the back of our knife, we are going to bruise three stems of rosemary. Once our meat is out of the oven, we're going to cover that in the minced garlic and the three stems of rosemary. We're gonna cover that with foil and cook at 325 degrees for about an hour. Once that hour is up, we're gonna remove the foil and take the meat's temperature. For rare or medium rare, you're gonna want around 125 to 135 degrees for that internal temperature. We can't have our charred flesh without a little blood. So next up is our pomegranate sauce. We're gonna start by mixing 3 fourths a teaspoon of cornstarch with one tablespoon of water and setting that aside. We're then gonna take a cup of pomegranate juice and put that on a boil until it reduces to about two thirds a cup. Once it has reduced, we're gonna add our cornstarch slurry and whisk for about two minutes until it starts to thicken. We're then gonna remove that from the stove and add one or two teaspoons of sherry vinegar. Give that a mix and we're actually going to swirl in a pat of about a tablespoon of butter. If you want an extra glossy, smooth sauce, you can also run this through a sieve as well. Just to remove any other particles that might be hanging out in there. And that's our sauce. Now it is time to make the bed that will be the final resting place for our hunk of meat. That sounds terrible. Corn asparagus salad time! Surprise, surprise, we're gonna need corn for our corn salad. We're gonna trim and shuck two ears of corn and throw that into some foil with about a tablespoon of oil. We're then gonna throw our little ear of corn pouches into the oven to cook for a little while. Um, honestly, I just threw them into the oven while the lamb was going and I don't remember how long I left the ears of corn in there. So, uh, sorry, but you're on your own on that one. I'm assuming you have a smartphone, just Google that. It's probably in your hand or right next to you right now. Look it up. Once the corn is done cooking and out of the oven, we're actually going to take that and then we're going to remove the kernels from the cob. Um, you can do that just with a knife on your cutting board. There are also some little like weird uh, cylindrical tools you can get, the unitaskers that'll um, do that for you. I don't bother with those. I just use a knife. 
Um, I know too that you can use a bunt pan to catch the corn kernels when you're doing this. Uh, I just didn't have one on hand and also I hate doing that because every single time I inevitably send the corn flying off of the bunt pan and I almost cut myself and it's a horrible mess. It just is easier for me personally to just do this on the cutting board with a knife. And then we're gonna set the corn kernels to the side for now and we're gonna take two bunches of asparagus and trim the ends from them. Once they are trimmed, we're gonna add them to a lined baking sheet, as well as 125 grams of cherry tomatoes that have been halved. We're then gonna take our asparagus and cherry tomatoes and put them in a 325 degree oven for about 15 minutes. Um, if you want your asparagus softer and your tomatoes more caramelized, you can do it longer. If you like them crunchier, you can do it less. As always, it's up to you. You're the one that's gonna be eating this when it all comes down to it, so. Do it how you like it. And then when that's all done and said, we're gonna take the asparagus, the cherry tomatoes, and the corn kernels, and we're gonna mix them all together. And don't forget to spend way too much time fussing with the appearance of your salad and individually placing little bits of asparagus, corn kernels, and cherry tomatoes until it looks good. And we do have the pomegranate sauce already, but I'm also making my own separate dressing specifically just for the veggies too. If you wanna make this separate dressing as well, you definitely can. It's just one finely minced clove of garlic. One tablespoon of fresh lime juice. And two teaspoons of a whole grain mustard all mixed together. And don't forget to salt and pepper that. Now it's just the putting it all together and making it look nice part. So we're gonna take our well-rested rack of kid and we're gonna cut that into double boned chops. We're then gonna take those little double boned chops and we are going to very neatly place them on top of our salad. As our finishing touch, we're going to drizzle that pomegranate sauce over the ribs. I really, really could not wait to try the tart. Um, cutting into it was so cool to see those little separations of layer between the thicker tart shell bottom, the nice red, ruby red filling, and that white and then charred on the top meringue. It just looked so nice and it tasted so good. I don't like overly sweet desserts, so I really liked kind of how tart this was. And then of course, we can't forget the cocktail. We're not done yet, kids. We have to have a cocktail alongside our meal. In a glass with some ice, we are going to add a splash of pomegranate juice. We are also going to do a good amount of either a cherry or strawberry liqueur or schnapps. You could also just do um, some cherry or strawberry juice to kind of thin it out a bit if you don't want a very strong drink. And then I'm adding some coconut rum to mine, but you could definitely just add a plain unflavored vodka if you wanted. Um, that would probably work out a little better. Mine ended up being a little too sweet because of the coconut rum. Now, you might be saying to yourself, this is just a red cocktail. What's so special about that? You've already made a red sauce with the pomegranate thing. You've already made that red filling. Like, well, you know what? There was blood rain. There were guts and viscera everywhere. It was a very, very bloody game. But also, I thought it would be very nice visual contrast to the Papa in our Papanoth cocktail. For the papa in our papanoth cocktail, you're either going to take some Baileys or a cream of coconut and using the back of the spoon, you are going to very gently pour a little bit of that into the top of our drink. If you're careful and you do it right, the cream should sit at the top of the drink and not really thoroughly mix in there. Yes, it looks disgusting, but it's delicious. 
And that is our whole Outlast 2 meal all finished and ready to go. I was super, super pleased with how this turned out. The rack of lamb was perfectly cooked. Um, the drink was super tasty. The cranberry tarts were awesome. And the amount of char on the meringue was perfect. I'm just really, really happy and proud of how this turned out. I'm really, really hoping you guys will try some of these recipes. Um, like last time, I would really, really love to get your feedback on the recipes. If you do, send me a picture or just leave me your comments of how things turned out for you. Um, I'm always looking to hear advice or criticism on things I do, especially with food. Um, so definitely looking forward to your feedback on this and I hope you guys try them and I hope you like them. I think that's pretty much it for this one, guys. Uh, if you have any questions on the recipes too, just let me know down below. Uh, if you liked this, like it. All the usual YouTuber stuff, you know. I just want to hear some feedback from you guys. Um, whether that's a thumbs up or an actual comment, I don't care. Just let me know what you're feeling. I will see you peeps later. Bye!